Jamie, would you, would you come forward now and bring little Noah with you? There's just room for us. Andrew and Gemma, and especially you, Andrew, as under God, the, the, the leader uh, of this household of faith under God, Noah will depend chiefly on you both uh, for all the help, for all the encouragement that he needs. So I need to ask you, do you both confess your trust in God as your heavenly Father and in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier. And do you promise then, depending on divine grace, to teach him the truths and the duties of Christian faith, and by prayer and precept and example, to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Andrew, do you want to take no. We are gathered here. Uh, this morning as a household of faith and we all have responsibilities along with this family as the one family of God here in this place to stand with these Christian parents to help them, encourage them, to pray with them and for them as they bring up little Noah in the way of the Lord. So as they've taken their vows, I want all of you to stand before us this morning and show your solidarity with uh, Andrew and Gemma as they do this. I know uh, your mummy and daddy are claiming for you the wonderful promises of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. All the privileges and also all the responsibilities of what that means. And so, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. And may the blessing of God Almighty rest upon you and remain with you now and always. Noah, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As we stand, let's pray together. Lord, the God of the eternal covenant promises in Jesus Christ. Would you grant all of us, we pray this morning, this family and all of us in this church family, the faith and the trust to be true to what has been promised. May we seize upon these wonderful tokens of your grace that you give us today and so appropriate them with gladness and joy what's done today in marking out little Noah as yours may indeed stand true all the days of his life and for all eternity as he is taught from earliest times the way of the Lord Jesus and grows up into him into a new and great and deeper knowledge of you his God and Savior so we commit him and this family to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, as we stand, we're going to sing together the hymn on the screens. Gracious Savior, gentle shepherd, little ones are dear to thee, gathered with thine arms and carried in thy bosom. May they be.
Well, now we're uh, going to turn to our Bibles and to our reading for this morning, which you'll find in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27, which is page 168, if you have one of our visitors' uh, blue Bibles. We're coming to the latter part of this uh, book now. We've spent a long time in the very great central portion, chapter 12 to 26, laying out all the details of what it means to be loyal to God's covenant, to respond to his grace with obedient faith. Remember we said right at the beginning that the the shape of this book is actually governed by the shape of the covenant. So it begins in the first four chapters with the history of God and his people looking back. It then gets to the very heart of the matter in chapters 5 to 11 where God lays out his great covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people and you'll love me with all your heart and soul and strength. Then you have all the detail of what that looks like in daily life explained. And now chapter 27, we get to the point where we have the sanctions. This is what it means if you keep the covenant and faith and trust, but there are consequences if you don't. And then Moses' final urging, therefore choose life, keep God's covenant faithfully and loyally. That explains why really if you look at the very end of chapter 11 and then move straight to the beginning of chapter 27, it looks as though you could read from one to the other because it's designed that way. The central section in the middle is not to be left out, but uh, it's there at the heart of the book and the the story, as it were, starts at chapter 11 and, and goes on in chapter 27. So I'm going to read from the beginning of chapter 27 down to the first two verses of chapter 28. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this law. When you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey as he's promised you. When you've crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. There you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. You shall offer burnt offerings on it and sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there and shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And Moses and the Levitical priest said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel, this day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. That day Moses charged the people, saying, When you've crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Isaac, Joseph, and Benjamin. That's their six tribes. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen, let it be. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or mother. And all the people shall say, Amen, let it be. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife because he's uncovered his father's nakedness. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Yes, absolutely. So let it be. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, 
The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of earth. And these blessings shall come down upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, as the musicians play quietly and as the uh, offerings are taken up, you might like to read over the end of chapter 11 there and then you'll see just how uh, it uh, presages these words that we'll be looking at shortly. As we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we turn our minds and our hearts as we give these offerings to the purpose for which we give them, which is that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ might be made known in this city, in this nation, indeed in all the world, a world so greatly in need of the light of your gospel of truth and of the way to life which is found therein alone. We think of the eruptions all over the world, political, military, and natural. Not least in these current days, the great upheaval in Spain over the Declaration of Independence in Catalonia. We pray, Heavenly Father, for that uh, rapidly changing situation. And, and we ask, Lord, that amid all the emotion, the protests, the marches, that you would grant a restraint, a wisdom to the powers that be on both sides in that place for a situation that could so easily spiral beyond just protest and civil disobedience. Even some would fear descending into civil war. Grant, we pray, a, a protection from that, a, a restraint, a willingness to talk, to negotiate, to bring peaceful solution to that difficult problem. We pray, Lord, for our own nation in days of change and turmoil and all the uh, shouting and 
politicking that goes on on the airwaves all the time, making us so weary. We pray for our leaders, for wisdom for them, for judgment, for clarity of thought, and for a determination to serve the people of these islands and not just their own selves, their parties, their politics, and their careers. We pray, Lord, for the churches in our land and for the need that is ever greater for them, for us, to shine the bright light of your word as a lamp to the path and as a light to the way, not only of ourselves as Christian people, but if it will listen to all our nation and to all our world. Grant confidence, we pray, in the great privilege that you've given us of this open word before us, with such clarity, your truth is declared, your way is proclaimed, and the response that you require is given. So, Lord, we pray for every place in our nation where people are gathered as we are this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ. We ask that there would be that clarity and that confidence in your word and that commitment to proclaiming it that all might hear and know without any doubt, without any uncertainty, the way of everlasting life in Jesus Christ alone. We think, Lord, of India and all that uh, is going on there in the Delhi Bible Institute with its many centers across North India. And we pray for the coming weeks of conferences and of training and of celebrations of opening new ashrams that uh, you would bless that work richly Encourage those who are involved in it and help all those who go to seek to help from this country and from others to know how best to help and equip and encourage our fellow believers there in that vast and populous land. And we pray also, Lord, for ourselves this morning as we are gathered, knowing our need, at least needing to know our need. Help us, we pray, as we come to your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would open its words and its light to our hearts and open our hearts to your commands. And so we pray, teach us your way, that walking in it, we might bring glory to the name of Christ and joy to the Father's house to which you have so richly invited us to belong. So hear us and help us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We sing the hymn on the screens as we come to God's word, which is a prayer. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. Amen. 
I'll do turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 27, page 168, uh, I think, in the church Bibles. Now, the last verse of chapter 11, before the great excursus we've been looking at for many weeks now in 12 to 26, it ends in the same way that chapter 27 begins. When you cross over and possess the land and are dwelling in it, be careful to do all the statutes and the rules that I'm setting before you today. Verse 1 here, keep the whole commandment, that is the whole covenant of God. In other words, God gives the reality of his great promise to his people and then says, take me seriously. God is the God of grace and redemption, but there's no cheap grace in our Bibles. And that's the message loud and clear of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Note the kindness and the severity of God, says Paul to the Roman church in Romans 11. Severity to those who have fallen, but kindness towards you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. You can't treat the commandment of God lightly. God's gospel word is a word of command. It's not just for hearing. It's not just for pondering. It's not just for discussing. It's for doing. Be doers of the word, says James. Not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It's not saying, Lord, Lord, that's of any value at all, says Jesus, remember, in Matthew 7. It's doing the will of my Father in heaven. It's the one who hears the words of mine and does them who builds his life upon the rock, not the sinking sand of self-deception. In other words, it's those who take God seriously in his command, in his call to be faithful, to be loyal to him, to trust and obey him, not to, to trifle with him, not to disobey his lordship. And that is the message very clearly of these two chapters, chapter 27 and 28 of Deuteronomy. Take God seriously. We saw last week at the very end of chapter 26 that uh, it lays out the respective responsibilities of both God and his people. So uh, verse 17 there of chapter 26 lays out Israel's responsibilities. To be faithful, to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, to obey his voice. And chapter 27 then here is fleshing out that responsibility. It's saying you must be faithful. You must heed these commands of God. Not by being disobedient. That will lead to disaster. And that's pressed home, isn't it? Twelve times as the people say, Amen. Yes, let it be so. Absolutely. It will lead to curses if we're disobedient. And then you see verses 18 and 19 of chapter 26. They lay out God's uh, undertaking. He's chosen them to be a treasured possession, a holy people, a people to obey his commands. And chapter 28 then, you see, lays out just as solemnly God's undertaking. And his undertaking is that he will be faithful to that call in abundant blessing or, God forbid, or in devastating punishment if those that he has called to that marvelous privileged relationship should shun him and scorn him and turn their faces away from him and rebel against him. So these chapters, you see, they shout their message loud and clear today. Just as clearly as they, they shouted their message across that valley between Mount Ebal and Gerizim all those hundreds of years ago. Don't be deceived, people of God. Take him seriously. We must be faithful to God's covenant call because he most certainly will be faithful both in salvation but also, yes, in judgment. We must be faithful and obedient people if we take God and his gospel seriously. That's the message here of chapter 27 with its great attention to the commands of God, to their, their preservation and their proclamation among God's people. But of course it's the message also of the whole New Testament, isn't it? Because as John the Apostle reminds us, this is the love of God, to keep his commandments. So I want to look at this chapter then. I'm going to try and summarize it under five headings. First of all, the place of God's commandments. 
And this chapter shows us very clearly, vividly, that God's law finds its true home inside, inside his kingdom of grace. Not the phrase in verse 1 that we've seen many times throughout this book already, the whole commandment. That is the whole of God's uh, covenant rev- revelation with all its promises and with all its requirements for obedience. It's what God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai in chapter 5. It's what, from chapter 6 onwards, Moses begins to explain what it means to walk in the way that the Lord your God has commanded you. That's a language Moses used, walking in God's way. It's where Paul gets his language in his letters, isn't it? About walking in the truth of the gospel. You see, especially in Galatians, you see, very particularly in Ephesians. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Walk as children of light. That's what keeping God's commandments is. Walking in the way that's true to your calling. And back in chapter 6, Moses said, God's commands therefore must be on your heart always so that you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Obeying all his direction for your life. Do that, he says in chapter 8, and you will live and flourish and inherit his promises. Keep the whole commandment, he says, so that you will be strong and possess. Do this, he says, repeatedly in chapter 11, loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, holding fast to him, and the Lord your God will drive out all your enemies before you so you possess your promised inheritance. Hence, as I said, chapter 11 ends with a a forceful commitment. And uh, it speaks about Mount Ebal and Gerizim and this great ceremony that's going to happen. And it urges, do all that I command you today. And so it is here in chapter 27, 1 and 2. Keep the commandment on the day that you cross over the Jordan. In other words, you see, he's saying God's law finds its true place in the hearts of his people. Yes, on their way to the promised land, but above all, within God's promised land of grace. Because his command is what marks out and and defines the land of God. And that's why we have this very symbolic planting, if you like, of God's law in the land as the very first thing that they're to do when they cross over verse 3, a very public display of God's word on these very stones. Because what they're saying is this will be the kingdom where God's righteousness reigns. It's the sort of thing, you know, that the, the pilgrim fathers did when they first landed in their, in their ships in the New World in North America. They set up memorials and carved the words of God upon them. I suppose the problem is that since then, quite a lot of folk in the United States have actually thought that the United States is the promised land, that they are the promised people of God. And that's a bit... And not quite right and a bit unfortunate. But you see, the Pilgrim Fathers, their, their instincts were right, weren't they? What they were saying was, we're Christian people. And we're coming to a place where we want God's rule to be acknowledged. We want to set his banner above our lives. And their instinct was right because the place where God's law finds its true home is within the kingdom of his grace. Among his chosen people. And that's the whole symbolism here. They'd uh, arrived in the land of promise all by the promise of God, all by the grace of God. Three times here. Notice in verse 1 and again in verse 3 and again in verse 4. It's there when you've crossed over that you set up these stones and you placard these commands for your life. Where? Well, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, as chapter 11 tells us, are across the Jordan by uh, Gilgal by the oak of Moreh. Now, if that doesn't ring a bell, you need to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 12 and you discover that that was the very place where Abraham first entered the promised land after he obediently left his old life and followed God's promise. And it was there, at that place, that God first appeared to him and gave him that marvelous promise that to your offspring... I will give this land. A promise of sheer grace. And so you see, these stones were planted with God's law written on them in the very soil of the promised land of grace. A land now possessed all by God's grace. So as Christopher Wright puts it so well, even even in its physical symbolism, the law is grounded on God's grace. 
And that's so, so important to grasp. Many Christians are very confused about this. Many Christians think, well, as, as soon as we come under God's grace, surely we can throw off his law, throw off his commands, because doesn't Paul say in Romans chapter 6, we're no longer under law, but under grace. No, 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 no. That is to totally, totally misunderstand what the apostle is saying there. Of course he's saying, when we come to new birth and faith in Christ, we're no longer under the law's condemnation. But Paul's whole point there is that we are redeemed for God precisely so that we will now live under God's command as his people. Listen to what Paul actually says in Romans chapter 6. You're slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient, notice the word, obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, the covenant gospel of God. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness, slaves of God himself, he says. So now you present your members as slaves of righteousness, that's what leads to sanctification. That's what leads to your holiness, your destiny. You see, you are redeemed to be under God's proper command now, not under sin's command anymore. And that's just what Jesus says in John chapter 12. Those who do not receive his words, his commands, he says, the word I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. For the Father has given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And his commandment is eternal life, says Jesus. God's covenant word, God's gospel doesn't change. It's the eternal gospel. That's what the angel calls it in Revelation chapter 14, an eternal gospel to proclaim to all the earth. And it's this, fear God <clears throat> and give him glory. That is bow to the command of your Lord and God through Jesus Christ. The saints in that chapter are called those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Well, of course, because the whole promise of the new covenant was that God would at last write his law permanently upon the hearts of his people forever and ever. And ultimately, that's what we'll see, isn't it? When God's people finally cross over at last into the new heavens and the new earth, his eternal, his everlasting kingdom, the home of righteousness. But wherever God's people are, his command must be in evidence over their lives, the foundation for their whole way of life. In Israel, in ancient days, in the promised land of Canaan, but how much more, says the New Testament, in these last days, now that the kingdom of Christ has been inaugurated here on earth among his people in the church. And that's why the Apostle Paul, you see, who was, as we know, the great defender of of the free grace of God in salvation. Even, even in his most vehement letter, defending that to the Galatians, he never ever suggests that obedience to God is now no, no longer something that matters. Quite the reverse. That's his whole charge, isn't it? You're not obeying. You're not conducting yourself in step with the truth of the gospel. What's hindered you, he says, who's hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, you must walk in the truth, walk in the spirit of truth. Not abandoning, but fulfilling the law of Christ. Whoever walks by this rule, says Paul, peace and mercy be upon him. So don't be confused. God's law finds its true home inside the kingdom of his grace. And those who have inherited the promises of his grace will be, of course, those who bow gladly, willingly, to his gracious command over their lives. That's the teaching, clearly, of the whole New Testament. And that's what these verses are, are picturing for us so very vividly, with these stones plastered and written on in the land. The true place of God's commands. And hence, you see, secondly, they demonstrate very vividly also for us the permanence of God's commandment. God's commands are permanent. They don't change, and so they must be preserved and they're preserved so that they can be proclaimed perennially, year after year, to God's people. That's surely the point here, isn't it? This permanent written record of God's command on large stones, verse 2. Plastered, written on very clearly. Apparently it was in a, 
an Egyptian uh, technology to do this sort of thing. And God took that pagan uh, technology and used it for his purpose, just as he took the printing press 500 years ago and used that for the dissemination of his gospel word right across Europe. But notice the insistent command. It's repeated there in verse 3 and in verse 4. And again in verse 8, write all these words and write them, verse 8, very plainly. You see, a permanent, clear record of God's written word in order that it might be proclaimed always. As long as it's called today, as the uh, Hebrews writer says in chapter 3. And that's why surely it's noted in verse 1 that it's not just Moses here, it's Moses and the elders. And in verse 9, it's Moses and the priests. In order, This is not just a one-off. This is to go on and on because it's always today for the people of God. Once you become his people, his words are yours to obey every day of your life. Do you see, God's word written is for proclaiming. It's a permanent word to be perennially proclaimed. And that's why God gives leaders, here it's the elders and the priests, but he gives leaders a sacred duty to ensure that that is always done. And he lays upon all his people the same sacred duty always to respond to the proclaimed words of God. Hence the repeated amens 12 times. Yes, let it be so. Everybody has to say it. And that's... Certainly no less true for us today than it was in ancient Israel. The apostles are absolutely clear, aren't they, about the permanent, the perennial need for God's word written to be heard. These words are written for us, says Paul, for our instruction, Romans 15. So that through the encouragement of these words of Scripture, we might endure in hope. And so that, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, so that we will stand and not fall, being overcome by just the same temptations that are common to us as they have been to God's people all through the ages. And they're written to be proclaimed, he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, so that we will also be wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and so that we'll be equipped for every good work. These words are permanently preserved in Scripture for us and proclaimed repeatedly and received by us today and they're vital for our salvation, says Paul. They're vital for our service in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. God's words, the true words of the true God of heaven, they're not, they're not a religious text for a special priestly class and only for them. No, no, no. They're written clearly, permanently, visibly, to be heard, to be proclaimed by all the people always. And that brings us to the next thing here, which is surely the great privilege of God's commandment. Our God's requirement of man is not something that's hidden. It's not some mystery religion. It's something that is clearly available to all people. It's written large, on large stones, very plainly. As one scholar says, it's available to all, it's intelligible to all, it's observable by all. And it was entrusted to the priests and to the, to the leaders not to hide it, but to herald it, to make sure that it's heard. So, so there can be no appeal to ignorance. No one can say, oh, we don't know what God wants. We don't know what God demands. You see, that is the very opposite of pagan religions, of man-made religions, with all their rituals, with all their, their mysteries, all their secrets. People don't know how to satisfy the gods. You can never be sure if you've done what the gods really want. You're never sure if you've offered the right thing, given enough, been in the right places. That's what I'll see this week in India. It's a land of endless shrines, endless offerings, endless religious bribes, endless payments to get merit, to get good karma. But you never know if you've done the right thing, if you've done enough. You can never be sure. You live in fear. Not so with the God of the Bible. The immense privilege of biblical faith is that we can know and we do know all that God has said and all that God requires. His truth is public truth. His law has no uncertainty. I came across a, a remarkable statement of the importance of this in, in an autobiography of Matthew Paris. Some of you will probably read him in the Times newspaper as a columnist. He was a, formerly an MP. He's an atheist. And um, he's actually very hostile to Christianity, increasingly so it seems. But he has written at times with some... Um, 
with some grudging uh, acknowledgement of the good that Christians have done. He, he spent much of his early life in Africa, and he saw firsthand many missionaries, and, and he had to recognize uh, all the good that they did. But he's hostile uh, to evangelical Christians. He's chosen to, be, uh, to live a homosexual lifestyle, and so you can understand that he's inevitably hostile to Orthodox Christian faith. And he's very critical of, of people he would call fundamentalists who, who take the Bible too seriously, too literally, say it's all too clear. But listen to what I find in his book when he's writing about the law, the law of the land, and what we need in a country to have peace, to have prosperity, to have a good law. Listen to what he says. Matthew Paris, the atheist. In our relationships and dealings with other people, we set much store by what we call consistency and what we call trust. You need to know where you are with somebody and that he'll not change with the wind. So far as those he must live and work with are concerned, consistency in an individual's nature is as much of a virtue as virtue itself. It's the same with the law, or it should be. First and last, we need to know where we stand. Stick to the letter of the law, and you cleave at least to what anyone can look up and read for himself in black and white. Resolve to alter or reinterpret statute and precedent as little and as infrequently as possible, and you minimize the occasions on which people will be confused about their rights and duties. Try to guess the spirit of the law, and your guess might conflict with that of others. I prefer certainty. The imperative that a citizen should know his position under the law and be able with confidence to predict what legal consequences will flow from whatever course of action he may contemplate. Deprive a citizen of certainty. And you've taken away as important a right as any we may have to natural justice. You've infringed his rights to understand how and where the law will protect him and to know how others' arrangements will bear upon him and his upon theirs. Uncertainty is the greatest inequity of all. Isn't that striking? Because that is exactly the privilege that the revelation of Christian Scripture gives to us. Clear, public certainty that anyone can look up and read for himself in black and white, which is what Matthew Paris wants, of the law of the land, but not apparently of the law of eternity. It tells us plainly how to find salvation from God's anger and how to receive God's blessing forever in bowing to his absolute lordship through faith in Jesus Christ, in trusting him with our hearts as, his, as a savior, in confessing him in our lives, bowing to his lordship, bowing to his sole command and rule, listening and obeying his word. And this eternal truth is available in clear black and white with absolutely no uncertainty at all. Isn't that an extraordinary privilege from Almighty God to ordinary people like us in this world? That's the great truth that's pictured so vividly in these stones. But what's the heart of that privilege, public truth of God for those who will be his people? Well, this is the fourth thing. And it's the priority of God's commandment. Look at the very first thing that he wants from his people as they enter the land. It's to obey his voice. It's to show the obedience of true faith. It's to take his word seriously. Verse 1, keep the whole commandment that I give you today. Look down to verses 9 and 10. It repeats, doesn't it, the very foundation of the covenant. Keep silence and hear. Be quiet. Listen. Listen good. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. So what does that mean? It means you obey him every day from now on. Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments, his statutes that I command you today. You see how verses 1 and verses 9 and 10 bracket this whole section. They say you must obey. And in between, it's explaining, isn't it, what that means? That from the get-go... A people who truly serve God, who worship God, they must have his words written and proclaimed at the very heart of everything that they do. That's the worship that God wants. 
a heart response to his words of real obedient faith. That's what you want, isn't it, from somebody that you love, somebody that you cherish. You, you, you want them to respond to your words. You don't want them to ignore your words, turn their back and not answer your words. You want them to respond. You want them to respond with, with warmth, with attraction, with love. And that's what this great drama at Ebal and Gerizim was meant to display. It's an, it's an act of real seriousness, real solemnity of the people responding to God their Savior with real heart commitment and in a real and, and honest confession before God. You can imagine, can't you, the impact of this? Two mountains, six tribes on each, and hearing the words shouted from the middle of the valley by the Levites about all of these curses and all the people shouting together, Amen, let it be. Yes, absolutely, as you say, real personal heart commitment to obey God's word. And notice real honest confession. You see, what's rehearsed here in verses 15 to 26 isn't the curses themselves, but it's the things, it's the behavior, it's the rebellion that brings God's judgment. And every person is saying, yes, let me be cursed if I should so reject the living God. Why, why are they doing that? Why does everybody have to say amen? Well, notice, notice the particular focus on the secrecy of all of these sins. It's explicit in verse 15, secret idolatry. And in verse 24, murdering your neighbor in secret. But it's also there implicitly in almost every other one of these things, isn't it? By nature, they're done covertly and unseen. Moving a landmark, verse 17. Mistreating the blind who can't see you, verse 18. Sexual sins, verses 20 and so on. Corrupting justice, taking bribes, all things that people don't see. There are all these things that we've seen through these great chapters, aren't they? Taking up God's great concerns about God and true worship, about family, about the poor and the vulnerable, about the place of sexual purity, about truth, and about life itself. And what this is saying, you see, is that, well, look, you might get away with some of these things. You might be clever. You might be covert and hide away and do some of these things and avoid human justice, yes, but not God's justice. God sees, and you can't fool God. And you are saying that you will acknowledge that you bring that curse upon yourself 12 times over if you live in defiance of him. No plethora of, of sacrifices or of offerings or of anything else will cleanse the heart that refuses to obey God's rule. Because the overriding priority of God's commandment is the obedience of his people's hearts in public and in private, in the light and in the secret darkness. That's the worship that God wants from his people, and it's the only true worship. King Saul found that. Remember in the story in 1 Samuel 15, he thought he could uh, uh, disobey God's words and that he would then offer sacrifices and offerings, and that would make it all okay. No, says Samuel, the man of God. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To listen is better than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of divination, of occultism. And presumption is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the words of the Lord, he has rejected you. And that's the same great truth that all these people are standing and having to say amen to 12 times over lest they should ever forget. It's not great sacrifices and burnt offerings. It's not loud songs sung 20 times over with glazed eyes and waving arms that God wants. It's what David says in Psalm 51, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite, obedient heart that obeys God's voice. That's the worship that God desires. You see what this, this great drama is saying to God's people then and to God's people ever since. It's saying, take God seriously and take your own sin seriously. If you read 
Later on in Joshua chapter 8, you'll read about how this event took place, just exactly as Moses commanded. And you'll read a detail that's very, very significant. We're told all Israel was there, including all the little ones, the children, including the sojourners, the aliens, the non-Israelites, the visitors. You could say it's the first recorded family service and guest service in the Bible. But there weren't any games. There weren't any jokes. There wasn't any clowning around or choruses with actions. There was no dumbing down of the message, was there? Just the people solemnly declaring and taking the Lord their God very, very seriously. Solemnly swearing allegiance to him. Acknowledging publicly the kindness of God and the severity of God. Friends, we've had a baptism this morning. And let me just say this to all of you who are parents here. And to all of us. There is no more important thing that parents or the church can show our little ones than their parents and all the grown-ups in the church taking God seriously, not flippantly. And there's no more important thing, I think, that we can show visitors, outsiders, inquirers about the Christian faith than a people who take the God of heaven seriously and worship him in reverence and awe. That's what the apostle tells us we must do, isn't it, in Hebrews chapter 12. And he says, if they didn't escape them under Moses when God warned them from earth, how much less will we escape when he warns us from heaven itself? For our God, says the apostle, is, is a consuming fire. So don't harden your hearts, he says. Be careful unless any of you should be hardened by the deceitfulness of sins. Obey the voice of the Lord your God. That's the priority of his commandment, always, then and now. Take him seriously. But finally, we must, must notice the true purpose of God's commandment. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 28. God's goal is not to curse, but to bless. If you do all these commands, all these blessings will come upon you. He says they'll overtake you. They'll overwhelm you. Yes, it's true forever after. Those two hills, Ebal and Gerizim, rising above Shechem, the gateway to the promised land, they stood for Israel as a reminder that every day of their lives they faced a choice. The way of trust and obedience to God, that is the way of joy and blessing, or the way of distrust and disobedience and the road to certain ruin. But notice, God's command is not obey or disobey. It's your choice. See if I care. Is it? Look at verse 10. You shall obey. You shall obey and be blessed. You'll see it again when we come to chapter 30. Moses says, see, I've set before you this day life and death, blessing and curse, good and evil. Now choose life. Choose life because God's purpose for us is good. It's blessing always. Come to me, says Jesus. Come to me and I will give you rest. I'll give you the blessings of God's kingdom, the peace and the joy. I am the way. I am the, I am the way to life. God did not send his son into the world, says the Lord Jesus, to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him, says Jesus, is not condemned. That's God's purpose. God's purpose is life and salvation and blessing and abundance for his people. But Jesus says, whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He has said, Amen, and put himself under the curse. You see, God's purpose, God's command is eternal life. It's we. It's we who can insist upon pronouncing that curse upon ourselves. But that is not God's desire for us. Look at verses 5 to 7 here in chapter 27. Right in the midst of all this uh, commands of God being preserved, being proclaimed. At the center, do you see what it is? It's a picture of these stones being built into an altar. That's a mini temple where God can be met, where God can be encountered. 
in the midst of sheer joy. Do you see that among his people? You shall rejoice before the Lord your God together. That's the purpose of God's commandment. That's the purpose and goal of his whole great covenant of peace, to bring people into his presence with joy, with great rejoicing. And this is a picture, it's just a microcosm of the whole purpose of the land of Israel. Do you remember back in chapter 12, we saw it again and again. In the place the Lord your God will choose, you will rejoice in the presence of the Lord. It's a little picture, it's a microcosm of the whole of God's great covenant purpose in salvation. As Jesus put it, to bring the lost back into the Father's house. Do you remember the story in Luke 15 of the lost son? To bring them into the Father's house. And what is the Father's house? It's the place of celebration and of joy and of gladness and of wonder. That's the purpose of God's commandment. That we should obey his voice so that he can lead us to that place of joy and feasting and wholeness and fulfillment and life. Life in its abundance. Life in his presence. Life without end that is everlasting. That's God's purpose. He calls us to obey so that, as Peter says, having purified our souls by obedience to the truth, being born again of the imperishable word of God, the living and abiding word, the same word written on those great stones, now preserved and proclaimed to us in Jesus Christ. So that, Peter says, we will be built like that altar into living stones, into a spiritual house, into a temple, an everlasting altar where God will live with his people forever through Jesus Christ. The purpose of God's commandment is not to burden our lives. It's not to bury us in the curse of death. They're to bless us with the abundance of life. That's why the Apostle John can say his commandments are not burdensome. Though this world is passing away, he says, whoever does the will of God will abide forever. It's blessing. That's why the psalmist says, I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law is my delight. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you give me life. I'm yours. The purpose of God's command is to make us his. It's to give us his life forever and ever. But you see, the Israelites needed those two hills to remind them it's not automatic. There are two ways, and there are only two ways to live your life. There is the way of abundant blessing through obedience to God's command. Or there is the way, God forbid, there is the way of unthinkable disaster. The Lord Jesus said just the same, didn't he? Two gates leading to two places, two trees, one fruiting to life, the other cast into the fire. Two houses, only the one built on the rock of responding to his word with obedient faith, only that one will stand in the judgment, not the other. It will collapse. And we need that word of permanent gospel truth to remind us of God's great priority for every human life, which is to bow to his lordship, to bow to his rule, which is now made known to the whole world in Jesus Christ. But we have it, don't we? Written large with great clarity what a privilege it is to have and to know the gospel of Christ and to know its great purpose which is to lead us to that great life. And surely then, we of all people will be people who welcome its true place. That is, in our lives and in our hearts, to be a lamp to our feet, to be a light to our path, until, as as Peter says, the day dawns and the morning star of Christ's coming arises in our hearts. That's when we'll see at last the fulfillment of all that it promises in the home of righteousness. For you and I can belong and will belong if only we'll choose life. That's his purpose. Friends, don't don't make your purpose 
Don't make your purpose at odds with the purpose of Almighty God for your eternal future. Don't do it. Choose life. Let's pray. Hear, O Israel, this day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God. And as Paul says, likewise, since we live by the Spirit of God, let us also walk, keep in step with the Spirit of God, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, the Israel of God. And so, almighty and everlasting God, Give unto us the increase of faith and hope and love, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise. Make us to love that which thou dost command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing as we close a portion of Psalm 119, number 119H in our blue books. The will of God to mark my way, the word of God for light, eternal justice to obey in everlasting right. Your eyes of mercy keep me still, your gracious love be mine. So work in me your perfect will and cause your face to shine. And so to that end, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always.